Good morning, I'm Damien Wilde, editor of Estates Gazette. Welcome to this live Q&A with BNP Paribas, Paribas Real Estate UK Chief Executive John Slade. This morning we're talking all things London. Last year was a roller coaster, politically certainly, but from a market point of view too, of course, as well. How much of this was a cyclical correction and how much was driven by external shocks? And where, crucially, is the London market today? Now, John's been Chief Executive executive here for five years, but he's been a leading figure in the London investment market for many years before that as well. So John, welcome to this Q&A. Many signals out there, many conflicting signals, and I just wonder whether you're sitting there feeling glass half full or glass half empty today. <laughs> I always like to think uh, my glass is half full rather than half empty. Do I think glass half full or half empty? The market's in a very strange situation at the moment. Um, the whole thing is in, um, typ typified by uncertainty. We don't know where we're going. We don't really know where the economy is going. And we don't know politically where we're going at the moment in London and uh, how severe policies are going to be or otherwise. Very interested, yesterday I was sitting in board meetings in Paris and we were talking about the state of the UK economy. Where is it going? Uh, perhaps sentiment in mainland Europe is slightly down on London at the moment. And yet, on my iPhone, the, the digital era came through this message that the Bank of England had decided that our growth rate for this year should be upgraded or the forecast to 2%. I was reading the FT this morning, a very interesting headline, the Bank of England raises growth forecasts again, positive, 2%, but remains wary of Brexit impact. So almost a complete contradiction on the Financial Times, our, uh, our main financial newspaper. So the whole thing is, is up for grabs. I'm definitely half full. I think we've got two years of struggle in our market, two years of uncertainty. But looking further forward, London is a major power city. OK, and you mentioned you were in, in Paris yesterday. I, there's, there's a couple of global forces here, aren't there? There are some cities that see opportunity in London having a tough couple of years. Yet with the currency impact, there's also investment opportunities for overseas investors too. Yeah. The whole competition thing is over egg slightly here. I think that the major cities are complementary to each other. There's a huge amount of investment capital in the world caused by um, the rise of the sovereign wealth fund, uh, the rise of the compulsory annuity in countries such as Canada and Australia, which is causing a huge amount of money. All that money is not just saying we want to go into bonds, we want to go into London. It's going, well, we want to go into bonds, but we also want to go into property, we want to go into artwork. We don't just want to go into London, we want to go into Berlin, we want to go into Frankfurt, and we want to go into Paris. So yes, there's an element of competition, but there's also a complementary thing, and no big investor or occupier these days is going to put all its eggs into one basket. OK, and from a, a currency discount point of view, London looks historically cheap, certainly in recent history, to many overseas investors. Yeah, not historically cheap. I think it was in the... Probably the last crash, which would have been for me 2007, 2008, we had a, a currency issue as well. And I, I came up with the phrase, you know, buy a, buy a building of 12 stories and get two free. So you actually get more for your money. Uh, whenever I talk to the major overseas investors, they say, we look at currency in one basket and we look at property in another basket. Undoubtedly, a uh, lower exchange rate, a lower pound means that London becomes more attractive. But there is a bit of a divorce still between people who are trying to make money out of currency and people who are trying to make money out of property. It was very interesting this morning, I was talking to one of my colleagues and I've never come across an advisor, maybe an opening for someone here, but someone who's a specialist in both currency and property and who tries to play both markets. Pretty big risk management game. Currency helps, but it's not the be all and end all. Also remember, if you buy at capital value with a lower currency, you still get the same yield, so you get a lower rental income in terms of currency value. Okay, that's not a new service line for you, is it? Someone who can combine those two thought processes? Be your BNP Paribas, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, and from, from an investment perspective, you know, it was three tough quarters last year, and then a fourth quarter that perhaps surprised on the upside. Do you think that momentum will carry through? I'm surprised some perhaps, perhaps not you. Uh, do you think that momentum will carry through into 2017? Yeah, I think every year in the last quarter, there's been an uptick in investment uh, activity. So not a surprise for me that there was last year. And I don't think there was as perhaps a marked uplift as there had been some previous years. Usually, actually, at the end of the calendar year, you see a, a run for exchange and completion. 
you see solicitors working day and night, even through Christmas and New Year. But this year, I don't think we saw that. I don't think there was probably the rush that there had been in previous years. Every year there is a rush to do deals at the end of calendar year because of allocations, because of statistics. How does that bode, you ask me, for 2017? I think it's probably slightly slower again at the beginning of the year, as it always is, as people reanalyze. What does that mean for the rest of the year? I'm afraid probably uh, the best we can hope for is similar levels of activity in the London market, but we're predicting an, another decline maybe of 10 to 15%. We came off 63.5 billion, I think it was in 2015, 45, 46 billion last year, and I think the level of transactions in the UK will be about 40, maybe this year. That's our predictions and most of our competitors' predictions. Okay, and the occupational markets, how, how do you think 2017 is shaping up from an occupy, point, occupy demand point of view? Yeah. Uh, we're in a good state at the moment because we don't have even though we seem to be moving into a weaker, or are moving into a weaker property market and a weaker demand for London, we don't have bad property fundamentals. We don't have overdevelopment, we don't have oversupply. So the occupancy market's holding up pretty well. I think last year, looking at my statistics, it was something like 17% down on the earlier year. Partly the activity at the end of last year was caused by landlords wishing to get their properties let because of the uncertainty they could see coming in in 2017, 2018. So incentives? So not incentives, but, but better incentives perhaps, or slightly marginally lower levels of rent. But let's get this let, let, let's get this income producing, let's make our investment work, rather than holding out for the last pennies. So people want to do deals at the moment, which is a good thing. Going into 2017, 2018, you're still going to see a pretty good market in my view. It's not just finance-led. A lot of technology occupiers now, maybe 30%, they will be coming in to do deals and you don't have the oversupply. So a slower market than 2015, but not half empty, maybe medium. Okay, and where's that demand going to come from? Because we saw some headline deals last year, Apple being the most celebrated, but Google too, yeah. uh, Facebook as well. So those tech giants have shown that um, they see a, their future medium term, long term in London. Do you think tech demand will will cushion and drive growth, will finance, and what other sectors might come yeah, to the fore? Definitely, not, not accurate statistics, but, but probably finance has gone down from 30% plus to 12 to 15 percent and that's not a trend over last year that's a trend probably over the last uh, 10 years in our market technology TNT has come from nowhere to 30 percent plus so yes there will be more apples and Googles there will also be all the businesses that come with them I think there's a statistic since 2012 there's been a 46 percent growth in technology companies in London, which is something like 46,000 new companies coming into London. So definitely, yes, it will be the tech sector. It will be increasing services. People have to service the tech sector as much as they service the financial sector. But there's an interesting trend going on here because uh, populism, uh, a change away from a dominant London, a change away from a financial sector. And a lot of London strength here is not necessarily caused by the financial sector going forward, but by the urbanisation trend. So people want to live in cities, and people want the facilities and the life that cities can offer. So you're not reliant so much on a financial sector and a traditional city money exchange discount houses. You're, you're, you're dependent, as are Berlin, Paris, Frankfurt, on a buzzing, lively, well-serviced, well-connected, well-communicated city. And I think London will benefit from that if finance is slow short term. Okay, and we have seen some of those tech companies move in from business parks yeah. on the, the M4 corridor, where, wherever they, they might be. You see that being a, a continuing trend as well. I do. I do. I think that's a trend of, uh, that's not a, uh, it's a real estate trend, but it's caused by a demographic trend. It's caused by where people want to live and the activities that people want around them. Okay, and you put out your um, psychology report recently, which was very much about that occupier sen sentiment. Are there other themes in that that, um, that we can expect to see impact on the market this year? Yeah, I think they are. I, I, I'd go back on that actually slightly because I think uh, in my career I've lived through four big recessions, and, and this isn't a recession, we're not in negative growth, 
but we're in a weaker property market. And usually in the property market, you've seen something like a seven-year trend. And it's been more property fundamentals which have influenced the market. So we've had an overdevelopment crisis in the early 90s. Uh, we've had a debt and secondary mortgage problem in 2007. Now the property fundamentals seem pretty good. There's no real overgearing. There's no real oversupply. And what's happened is you've got macro events coming in, really interfering with the normal property cycle. And that's what our psychology report is really focusing on. What you're seeing here, the market probably was uh, low in 2012. It had never really come back. There was a, a recovery sort of post-2009, but 2012 was maybe a low point. It grew very steadily to 2015, and normally you would have expected that growth to go on. But 2016, now this year, we expect a slower market. That's being caused by political considerations, by debt, by currency. So there are many other factors which are affecting the market. And, and, and that is creating a different trend going forward for the property market and a different trend to what I've seen in the past. So we can't just rely on the property fundamentals anymore. And that is what our report really was concluding. Okay, so a seven-year cycle. London was going pretty well, um, has been going pretty well since 2009. So 2016, the end of that seven-year cycle. Would we have been in, this, in the position that we're, we're in, even if Brexit, the referendum hadn't gone the way it had? No, I, I don't agree with you. It's a seven-year cycle because I don't think we went from 2009. I think 2009 to 12 was still the downside from, from an earlier collapse. Um, London was going pretty well in those years, though, as a, as a property market, wasn't it? Was, it recovered very quickly in 2008, 2009, which is a good plug for London. Uh, would we still be in the same situation? The market was very hot. Um, no, I don't think that we would be in the same situation at the moment. I think the uncertainty that's been caused has slowed down the investment coming into the market. Uh, property fundamentals, as I've said to you, are pretty good at the moment. So there's extraneous factors. And it's not, it's not just the event of the vote coming in and affecting. It's what all that, the, the, the springboard of events that happens after that that slows down the market. I think we'd have been in a slower market than we were in 2015, but we wouldn't have had a 40% reduction in capital activity as we had last year. Okay. We talked, you talked about that, um, that urbanisation trend and uh, London's attractiveness. How, how's the mayor doing? His London is open campaign. Is that, um, is that a cushion? I, th I think it is. I think it's, it's, it's not all about the mayor, unfortunately. I think the mayor is a great position. I think the mayor helps and has influence, but it's about everyone in London and, and, and what they're doing. So, yes, I think that helps. Yes, I think his uh, emphasis on housing, uh, the communications, etc., it all helps. But what, it's what we do. It's what we do that helps, and it's the actual actions that we have. And actions which happen long before him are going to have a huge impact on London over the next uh, five to ten years. Crossrail. You see the Crossrail stations going in and that becoming a reality. That is going to really open up London and boost London. Uh, HS2 will do the same. It'll do it for London and the UK. Yeah, I mean, I think the mayor helps. I think a London mayor is a great thing. Um, not talking about the present mayor. I'm not a great fan of the bus lane, I must say. The bike lane, isn't it? Or the bike bus lane. <laughs> Either. <laughs> but no, no, it helps. But it's, it's those macro policies. It's what we do with Heathrow. It's what we do with our communications. And it's what we do with our housing. And all of those, yes, he's very positive on them. His open policies are great. And it's a, it's a, it's a benefit. But it's not, it's, not, it's not a huge force in taking that forward. It's up to us all to promote that. Okay, and there you you encapsulated the full spread of infrastructure, really, from housing stock to digital infrastructure to transport infrastructure. And is that is that the key for ensuring London's continuing success? Governments, local and national, investing in necessary infrastructure. Yeah, it's the key. It's the key that uh, all the institutions in London keep driving that forward as well. But those macro projects, they're not just pipe dreams; they're becoming reality. And I, I remember, well, I don't know when it was, 10 or 12 years ago, when there was trouble with funding Crossrail, I thought, if this doesn't become a reality, this is a real problem. They are the absolute key to keeping ahead of being a communicated city. And it's not just about the real estate market or finance, it's about people wanting to live here and to work here. If they can get across the city quickly, if they can communicate with the other world cities, and London still has that, that sort of accessibility, that is absolutely vital. Because we have the office stock, 
you know, we have the real estate market, we have the liquidity, but we need to join it all together in an infrastructure way. Okay, thank you. We have had a number of questions uh, come in through through Twitter, and one of those is on Crossrail. Has Crossrail been fully priced into residential property yet? Or commercial property, for that matter? Not Do a residential expert, but looking at houses at the moment, a commercial property, unfortunately, probably yes. It's a bit like, is a, is a political event priced in before, into the financial markets before? Yes, I think it has. There's probably a little way to go, but if you haven't had 75 to 80% of, of the growth that's coming, really, people are not really as intelligent <laughs> as I think they are. Yes, I think everyone knows where Crossrail's going. Everyone knows where the hot spots will be. And, you know, there are some fantastic residential and commercial developments around those stations coming through. And Farringdon, the, what was the twilight zone around Tottenham Court Road, and now areas where everyone is buying. Yeah, yeah, there could be some more growth, but I think the bulk of it is there. And I think it's really good for those areas. And I, you tend to live in London, I think, where your, where your family home is from, which side of London you live on. So I've always lived southwest. If I wasn't wed to the southwest, unfortunately I am, I'd definitely be looking at Farringdon at the moment as a location. It's, it's a superb location and the connectivity to the rest of the country is amazing. But I, I fear most of the growth is, has, has come and gone because investors are in there and they've got to predict and see them. Okay. And are there areas of London, whether or not you choose to move to them, it sounds like you may not, um, but are, are there, London's geography is changing. We, we talked about Apple earlier and, you know, the impact that's had on, on Battersea and Nine Elms and, you know, the, the US Embassy as well, uh, not, not so far away from opening now. But we also have Old Oak Common, you know, which will be driven by Crossrail and HS2, uh, especially. London's geography is expanding. Are there areas that really excite you in the capital? Yeah, there are. I think uh, you know, the whole communication thing is absolutely vital again. We talked about Crossrail. Uh, we're involved at uh, TIQ up at Stratford. Uh, that is incredibly well communicated, both to the city and the West End, uh, by overground train and underground train. It offers a cheap alternative in terms of uh, not hugely lower rents, but lower rents, but definitely lower rates, so lower occupation costs. And at a time like this, when there's belt tightening going on, that's, that's an attractive area to be. Paddington, uh, exciting development. We're involved at, at Paddington with uh, Irvine Cellar and Hotel Properties. Paddington is an area which has been regenerated, but the centre of Paddington around the station doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a public realm that works or retail that works. So I think look, look for the development there, as has happened at King's Cross, as happened at Broadgate in, early in my career. Look for Paddington really improving. Residentially, it's, it's going to be those places where the people who actually work in London, the majority of the people, not the finance people, but the, the people who, who provide the service industries where they're going to live. And you can see swathes of London like Old Oak Common, uh, really, and uh, we talked around Wandsworth. There's still areas of Wandsworth. We talked about work with Scrubs up at Shepherd's Bush. There's areas around there where there has to be that urban infill where it's not going to be a thousand pounds a square foot to live, it's going to be 500 pounds a square foot to live, and you're going to see those areas grow. But I've seen a lot of growth in London. I've seen Liverpool Street, Canary Wharf, Paddington, we're on Stratford now. It's all grown, and I've always thought, God, there's one too far. But the city seems so powerful that there's always the scope for more development, more infill, and there seems to be the demand. And that's just not a London phenomenon. In Paris at the moment, they're building the uh, Grand Paris. It's a new railway line across Paris, which links uh, west to east. And there, you know, there's, there's, there's infill there going on the whole time. And the office areas in Paris are spreading out from the traditional areas, La Défense, or the centre of Paris, to places like Le Valois and EC. It's going on in all cities where there is that opportunity to, to increase the city. If you get your communications right, you get your urbanisation right, I think both residentially and office-wise, locations could rise. Okay, and another question um, that's come through on Twitter. Which London property deal last year, occupier or investment, best reflects the direction of travel for the capital in 2017? Well, uh, probably a series of deals. On the, on the investment side, it's got to be the continuing investment from overseas. Probably in 2015, overseas investment dug down below 50%, and it went up above 50%. Last year, there was particularly, again, a lot of Chinese and Asian investment. Chinese and Hong Kong in London, 
we were involved in two or three. We've just done the St James's Square deal. Uh, we bought Society Generale's headquarters for China in Shane. I wish we could do all the Chinese deals. Others have been involved in Chinese deals. There is tremendous interest in London, and there still is tremendous interest in London. And whether it's a weaker market, and whether we're in for lower growth, or a poor occupation market, those people are buying a market, and they are buying a diversification, and they will keep coming. So, sorry, it's a series of deals. In terms of the occupational market, the significance of Apple's move cannot be underestimated. You know, for a big corporation to make a statement in a very publicly developed, publicly a development where everyone is really publicly aware is so significant. Whether it's going to be allowed or not, but I can see that Apple sign, Apple sign on the power station. Pink Floyd will have to revise their cover. It's very strong for the market. And another occupational deal was right at the heart of the storm of London wondering where it was going in September was Wells Fargo buying their own HQ uh, at King William Street. Okay, and you meant in talking about Chinese investment coming to London and now talk earlier about uh, the consequences of political macro decisions. China have political, political changes of its own, uh, regulatory changes of, of its own around capital controls, which is perhaps encouraging people in the near term to, uh, to invest beyond the country. But we have to be mindful of um, what's going on in, in other markets around the world. And I just wonder whether potential protectionism in the states, a changing attitude to overseas investment in China, whether on balance these things are positive for London or perhaps could be negative? I think whilst there's negative international events going on, there's also positive international events going on. And I think that with a change of government in the US, the US policy now seems to be towards investing in infrastructure and tax cuts. You have a businessman who is, is at the helm. He's trying to reflate the US economy. So I think that bodes well, short term, as a, a crutch, if you like, to the UK economy and the UK real estate market. Uh, I was at a conference in uh, Switzerland two weeks ago where the majority of people thought the US property market short term would be a very good bet. I think that that influences what's going on in London as well. It influences what US investors will, will be doing. I think on Chinese regulation, they're really aiming at the spectacular deals, the billion pound plus deals, which really move a market and cause, uh, cause an impact. They want to restrict that. I think the lower capital deals where people are investing to diversify can go through. So I think always in my career, I've seen as one avenue of capital dries up, another seems to open up. The phenomenon we've had over the last 10 years is that everyone's wanted to buy in London. In the late 80s, it was the Japanese. In the early 90s, it was the Germans. It varies, but at the moment, still most people are looking. I think there's constant enough demand to keep it going, not just in London, but in the other major centres as well. Glass still half full, then. Glass still half full, I'm afraid. Okay. It's not likely to be any other way with it, I think. OK, a couple of um, specific questions have come through. Really, on I, I suppose, the, the working how, how your own business works, uh, really. The first one on, on prop tech and, um, and the impact of uh, digital advancement there. You know, how, how is prop tech changing the way agents work today? Prop tech, uh, digital, it's a way of life, I think. You know, it's the way we do business now. Uh, a lot of talk about investing in digital and what we do in digital. I think if you don't embrace digital, you're not, you're not doing the business. You know, we're all now uh, data driven, we're all information driven. All that is coming through on our digital uh, hardware. Uh, it's very much something that we embrace here. We need that information. We need it in this business right down from the bank, which is our, our parent to our day to day business. Uh, it's an aid to our business. It's what we do, it's how we do it. I don't think it's a replacement to our business. Uh, people say to me on smaller deals, is it going to take the place of the broker? I, I, don't, I don't see it on smaller deals. I certainly don't see it on larger deals. But business is a personal thing. You have to do a deal. You have to get a feel for a deal. There's other reasons to do a deal than just the pure statistical reasons to do a deal. So it's an aid to what we're doing. It's not the be all and the end all, but it's the way we as individual and businesses embrace that. But we fully embrace all the movements. We're looking at all our data systems, the way that we manage our clients. We use that to help us to do the business at a personal level. 
Okay, and an, another uh, specific question on uh, the conflict of interest, uh, uh, conflict, um, conflict of interest guidance that com has come out um, from RICS. It, as London se seeks to remain the, uh, you know, the preeminent, transparent, mar most transparent market in the world, are those guidelines helpful? I think it's. Uh it's the way life is going, the regulation, the regulations that's needed when you're dealing with the public's money or, or other people's money. I think the property industry is probably the least formally regulated at the moment of many of the financial industries. I think that it's a very good initiative because the industry is doing it itself. And if it, we didn't do it, we may see Big Brother coming over the horizon and trying to do it for us. I think the conflict of interest guidance is, is very good, it's correct. If a client or a pair of clients feel that they can work with one party and everyone is very clear on what's going on and everyone has established that that's okay and everyone's being given full information or everyone knows the limits of the information, then maybe there are cases. But really we have to abide by regulation and make sure everything is done at arm's length. So we have to regulate ourselves, it's the way business is done. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, do you feel the market has embraced the expanding serviced office co-working concept? That's been a real defining feature of London in the last couple of years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Further to go then, <laughs> or has it gone we, as far uh, as it will go? No, not at all. It's been, this has been a phenomenon. I've been in the business for 35 years plus, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it. Uh, serviced office has been a phenomenon right through my career. And I remember the early days of Regis. I remember the early days of Mark Dixon because I was at Reading University and he used to sell hamburgers outside the campus. So I go back a long way with serviced offices. When I first started in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, it was a poor relation. Uh, the covenants weren't very good. People were very, very suspicious of them as occupiers. Uh, in a boom market, they were full. In a bear market, they weren't so full. They've become much more sophisticated. They become incubators for other businesses. They become communities. I think there's a still a question mark about uh, the longevity of the concept. But in a market which is dynamic and moving, you need flexible office space. It's come of age. Those who are fleet of foot and adapt to the way the world is changing, which will, is very quick, will do very, very well. Those who don't will get left behind. But we need service offices. And if they're on property, they're something that's with us and are very much part of our market. And no longer a poor relation. No longer a poor relation if it's a very well-run company. And it's, a, it's like any business. You've got to get it right and you've got to have a view to the long term, the strength of your company and your long term income. And more with that than anywhere else, you've got to understand what your tenant wants to keep that income coming through. Okay, and lastly, we've talked about 2017, we've talked about 2016. I'd like you to look a little further ahead. Where, where might London be in, in five years, ten years' time? Will it still be the preeminent real estate city, a preeminent um, world real estate city? We'll still be on the Thames, I hope. Still on the Thames, <laughs> almost certainly. Yes, it will. Uh, 35 years I've been in the business. I've actually seen the London statue grow. When I first came in, we had uh, the Big Bang. We had Can London Survive against the onslaught of Frankfurt and Paris in this uh, more European stock market, bourse age. The answer has been yes. I think London will, will carry on. It will be a major world city. I think there was a survey, Power Cities or something, in London was number one. Actually, it depends which survey you read. Absolutely. As it's always the case with residential surveys. Residential surveys. Berlin and Munich come up high. But London's, uh, London's number one in that survey, so it's a good one to quote. Yeah, it's not, it's not just about the financial world. The financial world will still be extremely important to London, and London will still be a base, if not the base, of the financial world. But this urbanisation which is going on and the trend towards cities and the attractiveness of big cities is something that we're living with and London is at the forefront of that, and, and that's not going to change. Okay, and are there decisions that we can be taking today that will only enhance our chances of success? You talked about infrastructure earlier. Brave investment decisions there, and are there other areas that we should focus on? Yeah, there are. The 
housing and housing situation needs to needs a real stimulus to catalyst. There's a very brave decision there that government needs to get involved. Government needs to see uh, the housing market not just as a source of revenue for it, for itself around stations and uh, big development sites, but they need maybe to give some concessionary value away. Do what the public want, you know, give some of the taxes back. They need to give value away to kickstart these things, but they also need to prepack them. One of the issues here is that government wants to get it going. There's absolutely no, no doubt about that. But are they putting it into a shape where an overseas developer or an overseas financier is going to come in and go, well, that's a good package there on no the common. I'll go into that and I'll take that forward because I can see 200 homes and I can see that's occupied demand. And at the moment, the trouble is they come along and they see a bit of dirt without planning consent and without a, a real plan around it. I'm not picking on old oak coal, by the way, but they see that and it's not in a state where they invest. So there needs to be more investment in getting things into a state which will bring the overseas people in. And that gets caught up in a, a political bar between uh, central government and local government. So it, it comes back really to, to where we might be in our market at the moment, politics. You know, politics need to be more driven and, and realize and, and understand perhaps some of the foibles of London and the real estate market and, and react to them. And a city of shorter leases, more serviced offices, a city of renters rather than homeowners, is that the general direction of travel as well? On, on the serviced offices, more a compliment. So I don't know the percentage, sorry, I wish I did know the percentage of serviced offices. Yeah, serviced offices are here to stay, but they're not going to dominate the market. You're going to have big office users, whether they be tech or finance. In terms of residential, yes, I think that's, that's definitely going the renting way at the moment. You know, the, the entry price is so expensive, and the penal stamp duty, particularly at the higher you get up the market, is making people take decisions on renting rather than owning. And people who never probably dreamt that they would rent rather than own are thinking of doing it. Okay, John, thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. Do use the hashtag to uh, send comments and contribute to the debate, and look out for a full write-up in Estates Gazette next week. Thank you very much.